What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. It is Wednesday, which means we are rounding out the breakout candidates for 2018 fantasy football. We've done running backs. We've done wide receivers. We hit tight ends. The last of the breakout chronicles brought to you by Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football is the quarterback position. So stay tuned. Since this is the last of the breakout chronicles, I need y'all guys help. What you want to see from my Wednesday videos from now on. I think later into July and August, I'm going to start putting out more content on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well. Those will be like mini episodes probably, but Wednesdays will be my, my deeper dive ones. So let me know what kind of uh, videos you want to see. I'm thinking about post type sleepers, bold predictions, late Eight round sleepers, ADPs of 130 and, and later, things like that. So let me know what you guys want to see on Wednesdays from now on since this is the last breakout. Also, if you ain't caught my draft guide, which went live Monday, make sure you do that. BigDogsFantasy.com, basically everything you need to win your draft this year. I'm hearing a ton of feedback. Guys, if you already purchased it and you're providing me feedback, keep it up. Negative, positive. I ain't gonna be mad at you. I still got love for you. Because listen, it's gonna be updated for the next two months. So I take into consideration everything you guys send over my way for the update. There's a good likelihood that if you send me feedback on it, I will eventually get it into one of the updates throughout the summer. Also, if you have purchased it, the updates are gonna be coming every single Wednesday. However, it won't be today. The first update will be next Wednesday and then every single Wednesday following next Wednesday. Wednesday, uh, July 18th. So no update today because it just went live Monday. So just wanted to clear that up. But yeah, go drop a comment what you want to see on these Wednesday videos or podcasts if you're listening via iTunes. Leave me a comment on the YouTube channel and I will take that into consideration. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up button, please, if you love me because I love you. Anyways, let's, uh, let's get into the muck. All right, so first on my list for breakout candidates, quarterback, and this is in no particular order, but it is my man Marcus Mariota in Tennessee playing for the Titans. Now, he had a really bad year last year. Disrespected fantasy owners that drafted him. Right now, he's going off the board 120 overall, quarterback 18. He had really impressive rookie and sophomore campaigns, right, where he posted a combined 45 to 19 touchdown to interception ratios. So you're like, damn, this cat is ready to become elite. Then they pulled the reins back on him in his junior season. Those freshman and sophomore years, you're looking at extremely, extremely efficient numbers. He's not, it wasn't yet like a gunslinger, but you're posted touchdown percentages. So the, the rate of his throws that went for touchdown in his freshman year, 5.1%. In his sophomore year, 5.8%, which was the fourth highest of all quarterbacks in the NFL. If you're like, all right, this dude is getting better and better. He's getting more efficient and more efficient. He's got the running upside. Like, he's ready to blast off. 2017 happened, and that number, that shit fell back. Terror squad leaned back. 2.9%. percent 27th in the NFL among quarterbacks. Posted a 13 to 15 touchdown to interception ratio. So you're like, what the hell happened? For the majority of people, I'm starting to get around and coming into this boat. They're willing to write that into entire season off because of the geriatric coaching staff of the Tennessee Titans, which makes sense. I mean, when you look at the offensive scheme they had, they ranked 28th in the league in pass attempts. They ranked 26th in the league in pace in terms of seconds per play, per out, uh, football outsider. So the offense was not moving, bro. And when you have a quarterback like Mariota, who should be operating a high-flying, fast-paced offense because he's good on his legs, he's mobile, he's accurate, he's efficient, he's good with the short passes, you should be hurrying up and doing that, 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 that. You're going to have a problem when you're trying to slow it down. So that was definitely a huge failure on the coaching staff's part. It wasn't all their fault, though. I'll say that. Mariota was very bad at times. Like I said, 13 to 15 touchdown interception ratio. Their offensive line failed to live up to the hype coming into 2018 or 2017 I should say they were supposed to be like elite elite of the elite coming into 2017 that didn't really happen right they were supposed to be a top five line they finished the year as the 14th best pass blocking line per football outsiders they graded highly among pro football focus but I think at times they were inconsistent Mariota ranked 23rd among quarterbacks in terms of time to throw which is a stat tracked by NFL next gen stats so he didn't have much time to throw when he was doing his dropbacks the offensive line while they just 
disappointed a little bit last year. They still had a lot of bright spots, and at worst, they're going to be an above average line. At best, this offense shapes up into a very, very, very good offensive line because we'll talk about the coaching changes where we had Matt LaFleur come in as the offensive coordinator. We saw what happened with the offensive line there in St. Louis. That I mean, LA, I apologize to all you St. Louis boys out there. A huge liability to a huge asset for the team. And now with the coaching changes, right, we have Mike v Vrabel, the former defensive coordinator for the Houston Texans, comes in and takes over as the head coach. And I the aforementioned Matt LaFleur, the offensive coordinator of LA last year, will come in as the OC for Tennessee now. Now, I'm sure you've heard this narrative. If you're watching YouTube videos about fantasy football in July, you've you've heard this story 300 times already, but I'll repeat it for the sake of, I don't know, the seven of you that haven't heard it yet. Matt LaFleur has an impressive resume coming into Tennessee. He was the quarterback's coach in Washington when RG3 was there during that crazy, crazy rookie season that he had where he, where he blew up and, and broke out. He was the quarterback's coach in Atlanta when Matt Ryan had his MVP season a couple of years ago. And last year, of course, he was the offense coordinator for LA who blew up and he saw the 180 degree flip of Jared Goff's performance from his terrible rookie year uh, to last year where we saw him become hyper efficient and a much, much, much better game manager, not a gunslinger. He learned under Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta. He learned under Sean McVay last year. So, I mean, it's easy to look at it and say, like, he was the quarterback's coach, so he's not going to play an enormous part in some of these offenses. It's nothing he did. Like, he was playing, he was under Shanahan. He was under McVay last year in LA and say, like, ah, it wasn't really him. So, like, what can he bring to the offense? At worst, you're getting a guy who learned under the the most brilliant young minds in the NFL. And now he gets to create his own offense here in Tennessee, where I, I doubt he'll have a lot of interjection from a defensive coordinator, a former defensive coordinator, Mike Vrabel. I think LaFleur, the reason he probably left the Rams is because he wants to have complete control over the offense. Whereas in LA, I'm sure McVay had a very, very, very heavy influence on how the things were run there. So now he kind of gets to take over and he's taking parts of Shanahan's offense. He's taking parts of McVay's offense and he's going to put together the best pieces of those two for Mariota to kind of to run under. I want to bring you into this little uh, Twitter thread I came across yesteryear. I'll just read it aloud for you guys, for you people that are semi-literate, which based on some of the comments I get, uh, would seem to be a high proportion of you. Mariota had the highest passer rating and yards per attempt in the NFL on play action passes, passes, passes this season per PFF. LaFleur relies heavily on play action. Over the past two seasons, LaFleur's teams have used play action more than anyone in the NFL. So Mariota's very good on play action passes. LaFleur uses them more than anyone. This is kind of going back to what I was saying about how you need to use a guy like Mariota quickly in a fast paced offense that gets him on the run and gets him mobile. Fifth in highest graded quarterbacks in the red zone over the last three years. Fourth in the highest passer rating on screen passes the last three years. Why this guy, Spoonie, whoever he is, whoever I stole this thread from, he's excited for Mariota and LaFleur. Uh, if you look at the quarterback finishes, they kind of speak for himself in terms of fantasy and fantasy points per game. He's worked with Goff, Matt Ryan, RG3. Um, so a very impressive resume coming into this, you know, 2018 season where these two should work really well to get the Along with the coaching staff changes, you just have to look at the personnel that the Titans team has, right? I mean, they bring in De Deion Lewis, who, again, they're going to be using in the screen game a ton, probably. That's going to be, I think, a huge outlet for Mariota, because they had DeMarco Murray, who was capable, but, like, neither Murray or Henry were a plus in the passing game last year. Even if Murray caught a lot of balls, he wasn't doing anything after the catch, where Deion Lewis brings a lot, a lot of that yak to the back, man. And, I, and I'm excited to see Deion Lewis kind of thrive in this offense per under Matt LaFleur. They also have the underrated Delaney Walker and the super underrated Richard Matthews who aren't going anywhere. Very, very reliable possession receivers out of both of those guys. Then you have the former top 10 pick and Corey Davis, who a lot of people are expecting a breakout. He's coming into his sophomore year. I mean, I'm, I'll be the first one to say I'm not expecting an actual breakout from Corey Davis this year. I do like the talent a lot. I like the upside. But guys, there's not going to be like targets just coming out of thin air. Like there's not a lot of opportunity in this offense to just sway towards Corey Davis. You look at Matt LaFleur last for the Rams offense. It's not like they had one guy that they heavily, heavily targeted and used above the rest of them. You look at the number of pass attempts or the targets that this team had last year. It's not like they're going to take 40 of Delaney Walkers and then 40 of Rashard Matthews and give those to Corey Davis. It's just, you know, when you're looking for a breakout candidate and wide receiver, I think you have to look at where the opportunity is and whether someone's the parting the offense or like for instance Chris Hogan Brandon Cooks is gone right Danny Amendola is gone Jen Julian Edelman is 
gone for four weeks. Like you see the opportunity, that's clearly, you don't have to argue. I'm not arguing that Hogan is an elite talent, but the opportunity is clearly there. For Corey Davis, it's not there. People are just projecting. It's hypothetical opportunity just because you love his talent so much, you're just like, all the targets are gonna go to him now. So I think people need to pump the brakes a little bit and see that Mariota, first of all, is not a high volume passing quarterback. He's not someone who is considered a gunslinger by any means. So that, I mean, this is a whole nother, this is a whole nother video, but all, all together, it's just like a great, great, receiving core and in fantasy football when you're looking at a problem where you're saying damn I don't know who to take because there are so many weapons here that's when you look at the quarterback and that's what we see in Tennessee with with Marcus Mariota here right and the last point to make here is the obvious one that's Mariota's rushing ability the coaching staff really wanted no part of that they did not know how to utilize that athleticism and that part of Mariota's game in their game plan last year but Mariota was still able to pad his fantasy floor with about three I think it was like 300 let me see 12 rushing yards and five scores which ranked eighth and third in those categories he only had a single single rushing attempt more in 2017 than he had in 2016, which tells you that they were not looking to integrate that part of the game plan more so as they should be. As he progresses as a quarterback and the years go by, they should be integrating that more into the game plan. Nowadays in the NFL, bro, you see it. Like, this is the reason why I was listening to a good podcast uh, yesterday. I don't remember who's, I think it was JJ Zacharyson's late round quarterback podcast. He brought someone on who basically was just breaking down the trends of the NFL. And he was saying how overall the RB1s on NFL teams are getting less of the overall share of opportunities in each backfield on average. And he's looking at, he's saying the number one wide receiver on teams are also getting less targets overall and less uh, market share of the target opportunity. And it's because these teams that are adapting to the current NFL, the, the way they're drafting now, not everyone's going out and trying to draft a Julio Jones and fit them into the prototype wide receiver. They're now drafting players that they see perfect fits for their offensive scheme. And that's why you see a, a lot of these slot receivers become more and more prevalent in today's NFL because someone might value a, a wide receiver as a round six grade, but someone else might value them as a second round grade because they're like, this guy fits my offense perfectly. Coaches that are good, that are adapting to the NFL right now are the ones that say, this is the exact piece I need to make my offense successful. And this is the exact guy I need to do that. You don't take this wide receiver and say like, he's really good. So I'm just going to try to fit a square into a round hole, right? Those are the guys, those are the coaches that are succeeding. And Matt LaFleur, I think is on the right track with that. And he's looking at a guy like Mariota. He's looking at his skill set, and he's like, where can I improve? What can I do with this? And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of play action passes. So you're going to see Mariota's efficiency back bounce back and you're going to see him run a lot. Since he's already on the run, I'm sure he's going to be breaking away and rushing a ton more than he did in 2016 and 2017. So that's a really, really good floor to have in your quarterback. He scored nine times in his first three seasons running the ball and he's averaged 22 rushing yards a game, which is a great floor. And I honestly expect him to build on that. So Marks Mariota, quarterback breakout numero one. Before we get into number two, I want to give a shout out to today's sponsor of the video. I promise this is, a I'm actually going to give this to my champion today, the champion of my, my big money league. This is the belt we use for our league. The winner gets this bad boy. You get the names engraved each year. And this is from fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. They are the industry leader, fantasy sports industry leader. They won the FSTA, Fantasy Sports Trade Association, award for the best, I'm not even sure what the actual award was, but the best championship gear, I guess you want to say. They have rings, they have belts, they have trophies. They have a sick Lombardi trophy. You can also get the team's name engraved on them. I highly, highly re recommend if you're in like a serious league, not even a serious league, if it's just like a bullshit league that you do with your friends or whatever, these things are really, really fun to play for, man. Don't you want to be walking around with this kind of shiz? Go check out the website. Have everyone pitch in an extra five, eight, seven, 13 bucks, depending on how big your league is, depending on what you want to get. This belt in particular is a little more expensive, but I tell you what, you use, you use promo code. You could either, yeah, actually you have two options here. You could use promo code TAKE10 or you could use promo code TACO CORP. I have no idea why we decided to use that as a promo code, but TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P. Get you 10% off, boom. That'll lessen the price. That'll make each person pay a little bit less and a little bit easier for you guys to swallow that. But for real, everyone chips in eight bucks. You guys can get a sick Lombardi trophy, pass that around year to year, and it gives you something to play for. So fantasyjocks.com, it will be linked down below. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. And let's get on to quarterback number two. And that is... Chicago Bears quarterback Mitchell Trubisky currently going off the board 135 overall quarterback 22. <sighs> Here's the thing about Trubisky. I'm having a hard time being completely sold on him because of the fact that we didn't really see much on him. The good thing is we're going to know very, 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 very quickly 
whether or not Trubisky is going to be a useful fantasy asset in 2018. And that's because he's got all the pieces around him to succeed, as well as an easy early season schedule. So within a few weeks, you're gonna either be like, okay, Trubisky's legit, or you're gonna be like, probably unusable. I'm gonna err on the side of him being a very useful fantasy asset this year. You look at all the changes taking place in Chicago. The popular storyline here is to compare the Bears of 2018 to the Rams of 2017. They have the new hot coach in town. They have Matt Nagy, right? The former offensive coordinator for the Chiefs, and they bring in a ton of, ton of weapons around him. Last year was Nagy's first year as the offensive coordinator in KC, but we saw a historic season from Alex Smith in terms of him as a career passer. He profiles as a quarterback with much less upside than Trubisky has. So if he could pull that out of Alex Smith, then I'm excited to see what he can get with, with Mitchell Trubisky's uh, skill set. They also bring in Mark Helfrich to run as the offensive coordinator. Now, Marky Mark has been the Oregon Ducks. Yes, the University of Oregon Ducks. Head coach from 2013, 2016. And if you literally know anything about football or college football, you know what the offense uh, of that Ducks team looks like. And it's it's spread, it's high flying, it's high scoring. They're usually putting up like 79 points a game. You know, don't bet the under on those games. What happens is you go to your bookie and they're like, yeah, what's the over under on the Oregon game? And they're like 244. And you're like, oh, it's gotta be the over. Next thing you know, Oregon puts up 219 points. And you're like, fuck, I can't eat this week because I got no money left. So hopefully we'll see that come to this Bears offense and we'll see a lot of a lot of a lot of this a lot of eating going on between Trubisky and the rest of the weapons so look at Trubisky as a player right I brought up a, a lot of numbers last year because I wanted to see just how bad he was if he really was bad last year he's definitely built like the part right 6'2 225 you're like okay this guy has a prototypical build for a franchise quarterback and what I found was you know it, it really wouldn't be fair to judge his judge who he is as a quarterback based on his 2017 performance because they did not give him enough work on a week over week basis to get a a real warranted analysis. We can look at how he progressed over the year though. That is what I wanted to do and see if he got better as the year went on. His first start for the Bears last year came in week five. From week five to 12, which was a seven game stretch, Trubisky averages 6.37 yards per attempt with a four to four touchdown to interception ratio and completed an NFL worst 53.7% of his passes. Let me go back to that. 6.37 yards per attempt, four to four ratio, 53.7 completion percentage. Over the last five weeks of the season, however, from weeks 13 to weeks 17, he boosted that yards per attempt number to right under 7.0. Still had a three to three touchdown interception ratio, but he added two scores on the ground. And most importantly, that completion rate, completion percentage shot up from 53.7% to 71.8%, which was fifth in the NFL among quarterbacks during that span. So he went from dead last to fifth in the completion percentage. His touchdown to interception ratio stayed about the same. The yards per attempt is something that's very big because that's a that's a good measure of an efficient quarterback. So it's good to see. I mean, 7.0 is nothing like crazy to rave about, but it's a big improvement from where it was. And you saw the rushing upside kind of come into play as the year went on. So he definitely got better as the year progressed. So that's something to look forward to. Most importantly, he did this without even a resemblance of a fucking weapon on the outside. Kendall Wright, he, he was like his main guy. He was like Dontrell Inman at times. He had nothing to work with there in Chicago. They bring in Allen Robinson on a three-year, $42 million contract to be their number one outside receiver. They bring in Taylor Gabriel to open up the safety's hips. They bring in Trey Burton to be the pass catching, to be the Travis Kelsey of Matt Nagy's offense. They bring in my favorite, my man, Anthony Miller to occupy Occupado, the slot, and uh, there's a lot of hype around Tariq Cohen. You know, Nagy's been comparing him to Tyreek Hill and talking about working him in on the outside, working him in from the backfield, like all over the place. So a ton of super, super athletic, well-rounded weapons there in Chicago for Trubisky to work with. So it's going to be exciting to watch. Now, we're going to know quickly. And the difference in offensive schemes should make all the difference in the world. From last year when we saw Uncle Johnny Fox, Bears offense ranked 31st in play volume and dead last in pass attempts. Nagy and Helfrich will take what they've learned from the past, right, in these, these uh, successful offenses like Kansas City, like the Oregon Ducks offense, even back in college, we haven't always seen that translate, but at least we're getting a nice spread offense. And they're going to be able to use this to, to Trubisky's strength which are his athleticism, his mobility, and his big arm. They're gonna be utilizing a 
ton of shotgun heavy sets. Per Evan Silva's Bears Outlook, which he does a team outlook for all 32 NFL teams, I highly suggest you check those out. Good resources on rotoworld.com. Just go to Google, type in Evan Silva's team outlooks or whatever, you'll be able to find it. Ain't that difficult. Nagy's 2017 Chiefs led the NFL in the percentage of run pass option plays at 18.1%. So this is going to be really good for Trubisky's uh, ceiling and floor, especially in terms of a, a, a running outlook. Uh, a lot of those plays end up being rushes for the quarterback, and it opens up the defense a lot because they have to focus on not only the rushing from the quarterback, not only the rushing from the running back, but you know the pass also. So it, it's a lot of confusion going on for the defense, which should help Trubisky ease into this offense. Trubisky ran for 20 plus yards in five games last year, going for 44 plus rushing yards in three of them. I'm excited to see what he does from a rushing standpoint. And despite only starting 12 games last year, he ranked 12th in the league, 12th in the league among uh, quarterbacks in total rushing attempts. And I look for that to be a huge part and an improvement into his, his outlook in 2018. Now we look at the bear strength of schedule. Warren Sharp has pegged uh, this Bears offense to have the fifth easiest schedule against opposing pass defenses. Now, I'm not really going to get into my thoughts on strength of schedule here, but nothing on this Bears schedule even remotely scares me from a passing standpoint until about double digit weeks. Packers should be a little bit improved. Seahawks lost everyone. The Cardinals, I mean, they're, they're always pretty good, but they're not like a team that you need to necessarily just fade and stay away from. The Bucks, are awful pass D. By week five, Dolphins, Patriots, Jets. There's really nothing there that scares you whatsoever. The Detroit defense should be pretty good. Obviously, the Vikings are going to be good, but one of their matchups against the Vikings are in week 17, so you don't even get that from a fantasy perspective. Week 15, 16, great fantasy playoff matchups there. That's really good to see because, like I said, you're going to know quickly because he's going against weak defense to begin, you're going to know quickly whether Mitch Trubisky is going to be a good fantasy option. You know, a lot of the things I just love about the, the setup for Trubisky in 2018. Lastly, the Bears have a very, very, or they have a plus offensive line. I'll put it that way. They were killed with injuries in 2017. Per pro football focus, nine players saw at least 100 snaps on their offensive line. So they had a lot of different faces, a lot of different names coming into that O-line because of the injuries. Given health, they should match their, you know, 11th overall graded line per PFF they had last year. They did lose Josh Sitton to the Dolphins via free agency, but they grabbed uh, James Daniels, a kid from Iowa, with one of their second round picks, along with the god Anthony Miller, to mitigate that loss. So the offensive line should, at worst, be an above average line. So, you know, all the pieces are set up for Trubisky to do what he does. Brought in the coaches, brought in the weapons, new offensive scheme, a good line, a good schedule. So I'm excited to see what Trubisky does. And on that point, leading to this third guy, who is Jameis Winston, I'll talk about in a second. Trubisky is a guy that you could pair with Winston. Winston's currently, he's shifting back, obviously, because he's got the three-game suspension. But Trubisky is a guy that I would, I think this is a great combo. Trubisky, Jameis Winston, because Trubisky has... He gets the Packers, Seahawks, week one and two, and then the Cardinals, week three. You might have to find a third guy for that. Trubisky is a guy that you can hold off till until Winston gets back, and then you'll know what you have in Trubisky. He might be a starter, um, but Winston should be a surefire thing. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I started this video, or when I started this blog post, because I start all my videos as blog posts, that's what my blog on my, on my website is. It's just literally my chicken scratch notes that I do for these videos. That's why I'm looking at the screen sometimes. When I started this, the only, only guy that I had, like in my heart of hearts, that I was like, it's going to be a legit, legit breakout was Jameis Winston. Talking about moving up from one tier all the way up to the next tier, the two tiers after that, like elite status. From a fantasy football perspective, I thought this was the year Winston was going to be a top five fantasy quarterback. And then the three game suspension happened. Currently he's going off the board at, I don't even, this, uh, this ADP was probably put into motion a couple weeks ago. So it's probably even lower than this, but 136 overall quarterback 21. And guys, I'm still gonna be picking him as my second quarterback in a lot of leagues because I don't think people realize just how good Winston was in the games that he played last year from a statistical fantasy football perspective. I'm not saying he's, he's lived up to the hype of where he was picked in real life, but from the statistics standpoint, he was really, 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 really good. And this is something that I think you should take advantage of in 2018. Now, a shoulder injury cost Jameis Winston three games last year. So he didn't appear in three games, but it was realistically five games. He didn't last the entire game for five total games. What I did for these splits is I, I filtered out games where he threw the ball more than 13 times. So there's the two of those five games he threw the ball less than 13 times. I wanted to just get those out of the way. Look at games where he was a full-time starter last year. When you look on the left of the split, look at the numbers. He averaged more than 38 pass attempts a game, over 307 passing yards per game, and 1.73 touchdowns. If you paste that out to a 16-game season, 
which is what he played in his first two seasons in the NFL. So I'll bet these suspensions, you should be expecting him to play the full slate of games. He's not an injury-prone quarterback at all. You're looking at 4,900 passing yards and 28 passing touchdowns. Those numbers would have had him at quarterback two in fantasy football last year, only behind Russell Wilson. Let that sink in for a second, guys. Last year, he also set a career high in completion percentage. 63.8% of his passes he completed while leading the NFL in average depth of target. 11 yards was his average depth of target. So think about that. You lead the league in average depth of target, A dot, but your completion percentage starts increasing. That's very impressive. Think about that from just a, a logical, theoretical thing. You're throwing deeper passes, but you're completing more and more of them. That should be like a, something that ticks off in your head, like, okay, wow, he is getting better and better, and he's throwing deeper passes, completing more of them, much more valuable. And I get it, you know, they have the same storyline going into every year, like, oh, this is the year the Bucks are going to break out, we want to run more, we don't really want to pass that much, blah, 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 blah. They say that every year, it never comes to uh, never comes to fruition, because one, their coaching staff is fucking terrible, Dirk Cutter is an absolute woke, he's the worst of all time, their, office, their front office is terrible, I hate them, ever since uh, they let us see them on hard knocks. I, I think they were exposed as being horrible. And yeah, they brought in Ronald Jones. That's fine. They just showed you what they wanted to do last year. They let Winston throw the ball a shit ton. Like I said, over 38 pass attempts a game. Yeah, that might be because they were bad and they were trailing a lot. And I still expect them to be trailing a lot, especially in the division that they're in between playing the Saints, Panthers, Falcons six times this year. You look back, they had the third most pass attempts in the NFL last year. But more importantly, I looked at their pass run split, like the percentage, right? You could always be a high volume passing team because you're trailing and whatnot. But I wanted to look at the pass run splits like the percentage of plays that were passes compared to runs. I wanted to do this in like neutral game script. So I looked at plays in which they were trailing by six points or less, and you could do this on uh, sharp football stats. Six points or less, so less than a touchdown. So basically they're still in the game, right? You, you consider that a neutral game script pretty much. They were the second heaviest passing team. The second most percentage of their plays were passes in games where they were trailing by six points or less. So they clearly wanted to pass the ball for as much as they say that they wanted to run the ball. Then I looked at the pass rate when they were either tied or leading by itself. And guess what? Still the third heaviest passing team in the NFL. They want to throw the ball with Jameis. It's simple, no matter what they say. And then you look at the group around him, man. This is another thing that was kind of like Marcus Mariota. Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, the up-and-coming Chris Godwin. They drafted um, Justin Watson, who might be a few years away from actually getting on the field. Cameron Brait, O.J. Howard, and now Ronald Jones. Charles Sims is back healthy. Winston has massive, massive upside, and there is no doubt in my mind that on a points-per-game basis, he's going to absolutely crush his ADP. It's not even going to be close. He's one of the easy, 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 easy best values in fantasy football drafts this year. And I think, you know, like I said, he's like Mariota in the sense that when you have all these weapons and you don't know who to take from the offense, that's when you take the quarterback. So Winston will will wrap up this list. And I will say, dude, Winston is a great, great, great pick still this year. I hope his suspension gets lessened a little bit to two or one games. That would make him even more valuable in my eyes. But if not, I'm still not opposed to taking him and letting him sit on my team for a little bit. So those are the three guys. And I want to talk about Patrick Mahomes because I know that's going to be a big discussion point here. I think Patrick Mahomes is going to be very good in the NFL. I don't think we're going to see an absolute breakout campaign this year. I'm not sure what you guys would consider a breakout campaign. I think he's going to finish. He'll finish with a top 15 quarterback, but do you really consider that a breakout campaign? The schedule is so fucking hard for Patrick Mahomes. I don't want to say he's a rookie, but you, you know, this is the first time he's really going to be the starter in KC. When you look at the Chiefs schedule, it's so brutal to start the year. They're playing at the Chargers, which is might low-key have the best secondary in the NFL right now. Then they play at the Steelers, and their lightest game basically of the first six, actually probably the first eight game, maybe not. Okay, okay, I'm just going to run down the schedule here. At the Chargers, at the Steelers. Then they play versus San Fran, who has Richard Sherman. They should be an improved defense. Then they play at Denver, against Jacksonville, at New England, against the Bengals, who most people don't realize this, but they were the third best passing defense in terms of yards per attempt, which is a good number to rate uh, pass defenses. The only teams that the Bengals trailed last year in yards per attempt was Jacksonville and Minnesota. So Bengals are easy, are not a an easy opponent for Mahomes. Then they play again versus Jacksonville, then Minnesota, then Denver again. Guys, that is their the start of their schedule. Do you hear that? Chargers, Steelers, San Fran, Denver, Jacksonville, New England, Bengals, Jacksonville, Minnesota, Denver. 
And those games that you think might be light, like the New England or the or the Bengals, that you think might be easy matchups for them, both of those games are away as well. A new quarterback playing on the road or playing at home versus extremely tough pass defenses. I get it, man. I, I the, the weapons on, on the Chiefs offense are legit. I just like what happens is you're gonna draft Patrick Mahomes and then you're gonna be like, shit, I don't want to play him at the Chief, uh, at the Chargers for Week One. And then you might play him at the Steelers. You might play him against San Fran. Then like, are, do you really want to play him at Denver? Do you really want to play him against Jacksonville? Do you really want to play him at New England? I think his confidence might be a little hit in the beginning of the season because this early season schedule is just so damn hard. Per Walter Sharp again of Sharp Football Stats, the Chiefs have the second hardest overall strength of schedule, third hardest for passing purposes that's really it and, and in terms of jimmy g i guess he's another guy that people are gonna want to coin as a breakout i don't know man i just think the hype for jimmy g has gotten a little <laughs> a little too high if you're picking him in within like the top eight or top 10 i think you're out of your mind i think he's a guy who might be like pat mahomes where he finishes in the top 15 which is great i just i guess these guys might be more of the guys i listed might be more of value plays than actual breakout like at the end of the year pat mahomes and jimmy g might might finish with similar st statistics to like a mariota and a trubisky but i think in terms of value, those guys are much, much, much better because you're going to have to pay, probably by the time drafts come around, you're going to have to pay a top 12 price for Patrick Mahomes. You're going to have to pay a top 12 price for Jimmy G, where for Mariota and Trubisky, you're going to have to pay like top 18, top 20 prices. So they're breakouts along with value plays. So I just don't, I can't, I, I have a hard time putting Mahomes and Jimmy G on this list and telling you that they're going to break out when you're going to have to pay too much of a price with the risk that's involved with these guys. So that's going to wrap up this video. If you've gotten value from it, please leave uh, a thumbs up down below. Please, I would super appreciate that. A lot of work goes into these videos. Leave a comment down below what you want to see next Wednesday. Leave a comment down below if you agree or disagree with any of these guys. And I'll see you on Friday for my mock draft. Peace.